Hello, everybody. My name is Mark Chupka. I'm the Vice President for Research and Programs here at the Energy Storage Association. Thank you for attending today's webinar um, titled Energy Storage, the Essential Ingredient in 24-7 Carbon-Free Retail Power. This webinar is being recorded. Everyone who registered will also receive a link to the recording and slides within the next couple of days. Questions can be submitted at any time via the questions chat box in your browser, and we'll get to those after our speakers finish their presentations. In the text of your question, please indicate to whom you would like your question addressed. All meetings and teleconferences of the Energy Storage Association are held in accordance with our antitrust guidelines. We ask that you abide by these guidelines during today's webinar. The full guidelines are available in the members area of the ESA website. If you are not yet an ESA member and would like more information, you can reach out to my colleague, Brenda Lovell. Membership includes free access to all of our webinars, including many that are exclusively for members, among numerous other benefits. Please contact Brenda for more information. Among our benefits is a wide array of informative products. ESA now offers our members a way to choose what communications you want to receive from ESA. You can select among policy, events, and member news to customize your member experience. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you about upcoming events. Now, the first upcoming event is coming up right after this webinar. We'll keep the conversation going about 24-7 carbon-free electricity with Jonathan Bird of Duke Energy. Uh, let me introduce the speakers. Uh, first up will be Priya Barua. Director of Zero Carbon Innovation at the Renewable Energy Buyers Alliance, REBA. Priya will give an overview of the buy side of renewable electricity products and how large customers have spurred the evolution of clean electricity offerings by a diverse set of suppliers. Mike De La Pena will be next. He is the Technical Program Manager for Energy Development at Google. Mike will explain how Google came to be a leader in the purchasing of clean electricity supplies and how it has helped pioneer 24-7 carbon-free electricity development. Our final presenter is Niraj Bhatt, who is the Chief Product Officer at AES Clean Energy. Niraj will describe the development of 24-7 carbon-free electricity from the supplier standpoint and show how energy storage helps overcome the challenges of constructing such a retail product and can make hour by hour, hour carbon-free electricity a reality. After their remarks, we'll open up to audience Q&A. You can ask questions via the chat box at any time, and we'll read those out for the presenters when we get back to the Q&A session at the end. Now I will turn it over to Priya. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm so excited to be joining this amazing panel today on this important topic, and I look forward to the Q&A with, with all of you. As I'm going to cover three things today. Uh, I'm going to start by telling you who REBA is, then I'll highlight trends in corporate renewable energy procurement and ways in which corporate trends are evolving, and then I'll end my presentation with how we're seeing storage come into play. So um, REBA was created as a central standalone organization that supports large clean energy buyers in pursuing clean, affordable energy. REBA's vision is a resilient zero carbon energy system where every organization has a viable, expedient, and cost-effective pathway to renewable energy. The idea for REBA was created in 2013 by a small group of large clean energy buyers who felt that they could solve common market barriers better together than apart. And the underlying principle is that our community's collective impact is greater than the sum of each company's individual impact. Um, so we are a membership association um, bringing together large scale clean energy users, their energy supplier partners, other industry service providers and energy focused NGOs. Um, and we currently have over 240 members um, and, and over 1,200 people who actually participate in the community regularly. And as a buyer-led organization, 60% of our members are clean energy buyers. Um, most of our buyer members are corporate companies um, with companies of all sizes across nearly every sector. But we also have some cities, universities, and federal agencies amongst our membership as well. So collectively, REBA brings together the largest group of clean energy buyers in the United States. And 
and our members have been involved in 95% of all corporate renewable energy transactions to date. Um, according to the Energy Information Agency, commercial and industrial energy users are the number one cause of energy-related greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S., emitting 2.2 uh, two and a quarter billion tons of greenhouse gases from their energy use um, alone in, in, in 2018. So it's important for clean, um, you know, for, for CNI companies and other large energy consumers to lead the way in reducing greenhouse gas gases. And in fact, in um, 2018, CNI companies also announced new renewable projects equal to 60% of all new renewables brought online that year, which is great. But the complexity of the energy market and limitations on how they can access clean energy is really a key barrier for many energy buyers in achieving ambitious goals and driving efforts to green the grid for all. So Reba has been um, tracking corporate renewable energy announcements since 2008, and we've seen exponential growth of corporate large-scale renewable energy deals in the last four years. Collectively, over 39 gigawatts of deals have been announced since 2008, and in 2020 alone, over 100 new renewable energy deals totaling 10.6 gigawatts were announced despite 20 despite 2020's numerous overlapping crises and renewable energy not being a core business area for most of the companies um, and that momentum has actually continued into 2021 as you can see from this slide um, the number of new renewable energy deals announced in just q1 of 2021 has outpaced the entire 12 month periods of 2014 2015, um, 2016, and 2017. Um, before I move us to evolving trends in corporate clean energy procurement, I'd like to ground us on the um, buyer's journey to setting and achieving clean energy goals. So what we've seen with the buyer's journey is that it's not a one way or straight line path um, to getting there. And organizations are constantly evolving and growing their programs. Reba buyer members are all at varying stages of their clean energy journeys, but generally we see three key steps and kind of a feedback loop. So the first step is around transparency. You can't manage what you can't measure. So this includes accounting for for carbon footprint and measuring and mapping energy consumption. The second step is around commitments. Uh, once companies have completed step one, we witness them setting carbon reduction targets and making renewable energy commitments. More and more companies are using the science-based target initiative to set their greenhouse gas emission goals. And since energy is a significant component of many companies' footprints, many also set specific clean energy goals. And then the third step in the journey is taking action to achieve this goal. So this this could simply be by buying RECs or moving on to sign PPAs um, or other project ownership structures. Um, and then this process might restart again for buyers that have achieved their goals and want to now expand to looking into their supply chain energy consumption or getting to 24 seven clean energy or driving more material emissions and or social impact through their actions as well. So what we are seeing um, as the next frontier for corporate energy buyers um, are kind of four key trends that are really emerging and maturing. Uh, for the last couple of years, there's been an increasing shift in the corporate mindset about renewable projects, with a deepening focus on ensuring energy projects are optimized for decarbonization impact. Um, so companies want to ensure that their clean energy ambitions and goals truly drive decarbonization of our power system. The second is, you know, beyond goal setting, we've seen another signal that corporate buyers really seek to prioritize the decarbonization value of their renewable energy projects, which is the inclusion of storage in corporate procurement contracts. Um, solar PV continues to be the dominant renewable energy technology, and we're witnessing an increase in the number of solar plus storage deals. We've also seen an acceleration in corporates seeking to support their supply chain partners and help them build their business case for action. Um, in 2019, CDP data showed that scope three emissions were five and a half times that of scopes one and two combined, but that's grown. Updated CDP data from 2020 shows that the size comparison has actually increased to over 11 times, and we predict that as we get more data, the true size of scope three will become clearer and the comparable size will be shown to be larger and more and more companies will continue to work 
with a growing array of their scope three partners to really address scope three emissions. Um, and then finally, um, social impact dimensions, even in the pursuit of renewable energy is something we're seeing corporates increasingly place more value on. In 2020, we saw a significant acceleration of this focus um, with a particular emphasis on how renewable projects affect people. Um, from concerns about labor conditions in renewable supply chains to energy equity and, and justice issues where projects are built. So I'm gonna dive a little more into the first two trends um, since those are the, the most relevant to the storage industry. Um, so energy customers are really doubling down to ensure their clean energy ambitions truly drive decarbonization of our power system. Uh, back in 2019, we highlighted an emerging trend of customers starting to shift focus from purely deploying additional renewable energy towards the end game of a decarbonized grid. And of course, increasing renewable energy deployment is a key component of achieving a decarbonized power system. But at the same time, more and more end users see renewables as a means to an end and not an end in itself. So 2020 really showed a significant acceleration of this trend. Um, the first area where buyers demonstrate carbon focus was really in their goal setting with companies announcing new carbon neutral, carbon negative, 24-7 um, carbon free energy goals. Um, and we saw an impressive growth in 100% renewable energy commitments through initiatives like RE100. Um, um, but, you know, it was the 30, I think it was a 31% growth to over 300 companies. But if you think that's impressive, companies setting science-based greenhouse gas reduction targets um, through the science-based target initiatives grew over 165% with over a thousand companies now in that program. So beyond goal setting, um, in 2020, we saw companies beginning to change the way they procure renewables to ensure decarbonization impact. While this changed procurement played out in many ways, the inclusion of storage in corporate procurement contracts was one that really jumped out. Um, since 2010, we've seen an 88% reduction in the cost of some storage technologies. And now a decade later, in 2020, five co corporate companies announced transactions that included storage totaling nearly half a gigawatt. And we've already seen as much storage capacity added in 2020 so far as, um, so, so we expect 2021 um, to exceed the 2020 totals. Um, there are actually several additional storage deals that were announced in both 2020 and 2021, but lack the detail for us to include in our deal tracking. So, so these capacity numbers are actually in reality a little low. Um, and, um, you know, I think we, we definitely um, see that there's a few key kind of motivations often interacting um, behind the growing interest in storage infrastructure, namely increasing carbon efficiency, um, enhancing resilience, especially for essential services like data centers and healthcare facilities, and then also output firming. And our prediction is that we will see a significant increase in the frequency of storage being added to transactions going forward as buyers seek to incorporate one or more of those motivations into their deals. Um, so with more companies setting next generation clean energy goals, we continue to witness a growing interest in storage from more REBA members, and they're looking for case studies and best practices on contracting structures and making the business case for storage integration in, into their um, procurement uh, mechanisms. And in fact, based on member interest, our team just developed a REBA battery energy storage primer, which is planned for release actually in late September of, of this year. Um, which is a REBA member resource that is aimed for energy buyers who are interested in procuring energy storage to meet business needs. Um, this is still an emerging interest area for most buyers with a, with a few leaders really paving the way for others. Um, and I'm excited to, to turn it back to Mark, um, actually to turn it over to Mike um, so that we can hear from some of those leaders um, in this space. Um, to, to run through kind of the details and, and, and what, they're, what they're seeing and doing. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mike. Thanks Priya, appreciate it. Um, make sure I can drive here. Looks like it's coming through all right. Nice to meet everyone. Uh, this is Mike Delapena from Google. Here to talk today a bit more about our carbon free energy goal and energy storage's role in achieving that goal. Uh, Priya provided some really good context on corporate procurement trends in general. And I'll be providing a bit more company-specific context from the point of view of Google. 
Uh, I want to convey three main components today. Uh, first is I want to provide some context on Google's historical energy consumption and procurement uh, activities. Uh, from there, talk a little bit about our 24-7 carbon-free energy goal, why it was adopted, and what that goal means. Um, and then to wrap up, talk a little bit about how we are planning to achieve this goal, including energy storage's role in achieving the 24-7 carbon-free energy goal. So without further ado, hopefully this slide will advance. There it is. Um, Google's energy consumption, uh, electricity consumption, primarily is driven by our data center fleet, which is growing year over year at a pretty, pretty uh, aggressive rate. Um, in 2019, total alphabet global electricity use was over 12 terawatt hours. Um, this is expected to keep rising uh, at a clip of, let's call it close to 20% per year. Um, and so the stakes for energy use and the environmental impact are high. Um, this is the biggest cost of operating our infrastructure. And we see our 24 seven goal as one of the key ways we can drive sustainability for the company. To that end, we truly have a global fleet. Uh, what you see in the slide here is the locations of our current owned and operated data centers. Um, we span across four continents, majority of our uh, facilities in the United States with a solid presence in Europe and a few across the rest of the world. Um, when we think about this 24-7 goal, I will uh, talk about this in a bit more detail later, but the key, key aspect to keep in mind is we're looking to balance generation and load from a carbon-free energy perspective within each of these regions within each hour of each year by 2030. So to that end, our activities uh, since 2010 have lined up a number of renewable energy projects across the world. Uh, we've got nearly six gigawatts of renewable energy procured um, as shown in this map, primarily uh, wind driven in the central United States and uh, wind in the Nordics in Europe. Um, this has represented over 55 uh, wind and solar agreements and over seven billion dollars worth of investment in renewable projects. Uh, this gives us a good leg up in starting our carbon free energy journey. But what you will notice if you know you kept a, kept an eye towards where our data centers were and where these projects are located is there's not perfect overlap. And so when we talk about um, moving from a goal of 100% renewable energy to carbon free energy, uh, there needs to be some kind of geographical rebalancing of our procurement activities. The topic of 100% renewable energy, uh, that's kind of a common goal for companies and Google has been achieving that goal since 2017. Uh, just to make sure the goal is not misunderstood, what this means is that the aggregate production from all the renewable energy facilities you saw on the previous slide, uh, summed over the course of a given year, uh, is at least equal to the amount of electricity consumption across our data center fleet. Um, and what we're trying to achieve with the 24-7 goal is to address the sort of dissonance there that the production is not always at the same time as the load. Um, and in addition, the production may not be in the same region as the load. So before I go on to the goal, I wanted to highlight one, uh, one key attribute of our data centers, which we're particularly proud of, uh, which is the tremendous energy efficiency that we've been able to drive. Um, we're talking here about a lot of uh, ways to minimize our impact and our firm view is that the best, uh, most sustainable megawatt hour is one not, not consumed. Uh, Google data centers are approximately two times more energy efficient than your typical data center, um, something that we've been driving at over the past decade and have made uh, tremendous gains on. So with that, I um, wanted to highlight our goal, which was announced September of last year. Uh, the focus here is by 2030, we intend to source carbon-free energy for all of Google's operations in all places at all times. So again, this is a pretty big departure from the 100% renewable goal, which was strictly volumetric um, and represented a, a huge step forward for our company in making this broadcast externally last September. So why did we focus on this goal? Why did we decide this versus other, other goals? Um, we really see these types of goals in a continuum. Um, far off to the left, you'll see here would be sort of a carbon neutral goal where um, we're offsetting emissions with uh, emissions reduction credits. Um, moving kind of in a more aggressive way, you can look to reduce your emissions through a 100% renewable goal, which we had and continue to have 
Um, but ultimately, we want to have a carbon-free energy grid, not just for Google, but for all, um, which is why the 24-7 carbon-free energy goal, we think, is the right way forward. Um, it's the true way to eliminate emissions. So what does this look like for a given data center? Um, what you have here is a quick profile over the course of a year for data center consumption, shown in uh, essentially the black bar for our Iowa data center, and wind production, shown in green, um, throughout the course of the year. What you see here is, at times, uh, the renewable energy, shown in green from the wind farm, uh, meets, at least meets, uh, the total consumption, and thus we can say we're 100% carbon-free during that hour. But there are obviously many hours during the year where you're seeing a black bar, um, and thus we are pulling from the grid, if you will. Um, that grid is not entirely carbon-free, and those black sections are what we're focused on eliminating by 2030. So what does our current footprint look like today? This is a, a bit of a busy slide and it references a, a white paper that we've published externally if you'd like more details, but essentially we have a wide uh, range of carbon-free energy scores across our data center fleet um, and across regions. Uh, what you see here is kind of by color, green being more intense, higher levels of carbon-free energy um, and closer to black being lower levels. Um, and the, the change over time is just a quick pictograph to show you how this value varies over the course of a year. But in aggregate, what we're looking at is a global fleet that's about two thirds based on carbon free energy on a global annual hourly basis. Um, and we wanted to highlight that we have at least five regions, including uh, one in Iowa, where I happen to be sitting right now, um, that are operating at at least 90% carbon free energy. And again, our goal is to get all this to full carbon-free energy by 2030. So how do we think about achieving this goal? You know, we are purchasing many types of, of renewables. Um, it's not all about cost. A good portion of it is about how we can match this carbon-free energy shape that's needed. So wind and solar is great, but it will only get us so far, hence the need for energy storage technologies. Um, in addition, uh, we're looking to um, employ different technologies like uh, some more deep mine forecasting technologies to get better value out of existing wind assets. Um, we're exploring a, a variety of next generation technologies, including enhanced geothermal, long duration energy storage uh, technologies that we know will be needed by the end of the decade to meet our goal. And across our regions, we're advocating for a variety of policies uh, to remove barriers to, to corporate uh, procurement in the way that you know, we think is needed to reach 24-7 carbon free energy, and also advocating for market reforms that, that open up markets for more competition. So why do we pick 2030? Um, it's a very aggressive goal, there's no doubt about it, but we see historic cost declines, um, both in the future, but obviously uh, achieved in the past 10 years, as Priya mentioned, for, for better energy storage. Um, in addition, we see governments making huge commitments uh, to cleaning up the grid, uh, both in the near term and throughout 2030. Um, and frankly, we're seeing a lot of progress in, in commercializing these technologies um, in such a way that we think this is achievable. So uh, I'll highlight a few quick details about this slide, but then this really sets it up for Niraj and AES to talk in a bit more detail. But for those that followed in May of this year, uh, Google and AES announced a first-of-its-kind retail supply agreement that will guarantee uh, our data centers in Virginia will operate on 90% carbon-free energy by 2024. Um, what excites us about this, uh, this deal with AES is it's truly an example of that blending of different renewable energy technologies um, in addition to energy storage uh, that delivers to us sort of a firm uh, carbon-free energy product for consumption across our data center fleet in the given region. So what you see on the right-hand side in the chart, which Niraj can describe in a lot more detail than I can, is uh, production of the various components of the carbon-free energy portfolio um, that is proposed by AES. So we have some components from hydro, some from solar, and some from wind. And then I'll spend a bit of time dwelling on the purple bar, which is storage discharge. Um, essentially, the way we think about energy storage within our carbon-free energy portfolio is it is charging from what we would call excess carbon-free energy or the light blue bars above the black bar. So essentially, when our contracted renewables are producing more than we can consume in a given region, 
as long as the energy storage is charging at that time, we would call that to be carbon free energy charge. And thus, when it discharges, we credit the output with uh, the same carbon free energy credit. Um, important to note, we do not require the energy storage to be strictly co located with those resources. Um, you can read a bit more about this in our methodology papers released publicly, but the way we view energy storage and all these uh, assets at large is they need to be connected to the same regional grid. Uh, regional grid in the United States here being uh, the balancing authority, and in this particular case, uh, PJM. So as long as the battery is connected to the same regional grid, in this case PJM, and it's charging and can be proven to be charged at the same time there's excess carbon free energy, uh, then we're content counting the subsequent discharge as part of our carbon free, free portfolio. Um, last comment here, and then I'll kick it over to Niraj for, again, a lot more detail on this particular transaction, is you'll note that the, the gray bars are what remain, right? The, the purple bar only gets us so far, um, and that's mostly driven by the, the durations available at cost-effective price points for lithium-ion energy storage right now. Um, what we're excited about and what we're actively exploring is new long-duration energy storage technologies that might be able to address what remains in the in the, in the gray bars. So in short, Google envisions a future in which not only Google, but energy consumers everywhere have access to affordable 24 seven carbon free energy. And with that, I'll hand it off to Niraj. Super, th th thank you, Mike. Um, thanks Mark and Priya as well for your preceding comments. I'm really excited to be here. My name is Niraj Bhatt. Uh, I'm the chief product officer for AS Clean Energy. Um, to talk about a topic that is pretty close to my heart. I spent a lot of time, me and my team and many, many others at AS, have spent a lot of time on 24-7 CFE over the course of the last couple of years. Um, and I think it's something that's going to be of a special, special importance, I think, for the storage stakeholder group. It, it's, in my view, one of the first kind of uh, carbon and uh, renewable energy procurement metrics and targets that really has a very fundamental role for storage. So I think all of you all um, as part of this webinar will be an important stakeholder in, in pushing this forward. A little delay on that. All right, so I think most people are familiar with AES, probably more so from the fact that we're a co-owner of Fluent, um, obviously one of the leading uh, energy storage companies in the world. Um, but so, so you know a little bit more about AES in particular, global independent power producer an energy company. We own and operate over 30 gigawatts across the world today. Very significant renewables uh, pipeline, about seven gigawatts right now. In the U.S., the U.S. Clean Energy Unit, which is what I'm part of, um, we have about a four gigawatt, close to four gigawatt now operating portfolio, very significant pipeline, 20 plus gigawatts of wind, solar storage, um, and a pretty significant clip of growing that business, uh, very active in, in the country today. So the mission of AES more broadly is to accelerate the the future of energy and within the clean energy unit in particular we fundamentally view the future of energy to be a hundred percent carbon free energy grid um, and over the course of the last couple of years as we as we've been working with google and other customers we've really come to believe that the hourly match of the renewables that we produce and the load that our customers have is going to be critical to that and so this goal is something that we are, are fully behind um, from a, an energy buying perspective uh, Mike had a slide that was a little bit like this that talked about what it means to be a, a leader in the clean energy space. Um, you know, if you look back two, three decades, uh, sorry, uh, two, two decades, you start to see where sustainability objectives started around carbon offsets and then moving to solar rooftops through renewable purchases, um, unbundled recs, and then moving on to 100% clean energy. And I think we're also of the view that today the next frontier is really the 24 seven or the hourly matched carbon free grid. Um, part of what makes this so important is highlighted here on this slide. Uh, if, if you all have seen some of the Google white papers, you'll have seen diagrams like what I'm showing here on the right. For those that haven't, a quick idea of this is each of these blocks is effectively a canvas, uh, 8,760 pixels. You have 24 hours in the day on the vertical axis, 365 days of the year in the horizontal axis. Um, anything that's bright green or dark green is a carbon-free hour uh, of procurement. Anything that is gray is, uh, um, is a carbon-intensive uh, hour of procurement. And so 
uh, different grids have different inherent carbon-free percentages. The PJM grid, for instance, which is what a lot of this is based on here, is something like 30, 35 to 40 percent carbon-free if you average it over the course of the year. Um, what we find very transformational about the 24-7 standard is really what it does both on the grid and for carbon. Um, so if you take a look at just using one technology alone, you take solar, for instance, and you you know you paint a nice swath of green throughout the middle of that canvas. It's the daylit hours, um, and you get to you can get uh, to about 65% carbon-free energy on that basis alone, um, and a pretty good chunk of so of carbon that's offset from that. We're showing 2.2 million tons over the course of a decade here. Um, wind uh, higher capacity factor, a little bit more Jackson Pollock in its view uh, of what it covers of the canvas. Um, you get uh, a higher CFE percentage and uh, a higher carbon offset uh, uh, percentage as well. What's really transformational when we think about the 24-7 piece is what you can really cover. You can really cover a much more significant uh, percentage of that canvas when you do a combined portfolio. Uh, the wind, the solar, and the storage working together here in this example to get north of 90%. Um, but what's also very interesting about it is that uh, the the carbon the tons of carbon that are offset or reduced are not uh, are not linear right you really start to dig deeper into those very carbon intensive hours and so you get much more carbon um, carbon reduction when you're really painting the full canvas rather than kind of cherry picking for instance the solar hours which uh, in most grids of the country are becoming less and less carbon intensive so the ability to move megawatt hours as uh, as the other panelists have talked about, is really fairly critical to this, um, and and that's fundamentally where storage is um, is the leading contender. Uh, as Mike referenced, um, we worked on this solution with them and, and announced a deal in May of this year, uh, first of its kind, twenty four seven carbon free energy solution, um, targeting uh, Google's Northern Virginia data centers. And to give you all a little bit of a flavor of how that worked and 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 what the objectives were, when we started on this process uh, with Google, you know, probably close to two years ago now, um, they had two key goals. One was, of course, to advance their 24/7 carbon free objectives. They announced them in September of last year, as Mike mentioned, but of course had been thinking about them for quite uh, a while before that. So to really push effort and uh, and, and advance those objectives was was critical for them. But then it was also uh, that there there that that there's a market and an economic element as well to really reduce complexity and reduce market risk was critical. Um, uh, all companies can be leaders, but they're not cost insensitive, as I'm sure Mike and his colleagues will tell you as well. So having an ability to kind of get this uh, objective at the right price with a reduction in market risk um, was critical to them. So what we ended up putting together was a structure that looks like what you see on the page here. Um, we went out to the market on behalf of Google and solicited bids from developers across PJM. Um, and you know this was probably the most interesting part of this process, right? You can, you can model 24-7 uh, CFE in Excel and other places, and then when you go to the market and talk to real developers with real projects, with real challenges, you know, all those nice little assumptions start to really get tested. So um, this was a this was a um, kind of a, an interesting and challenging part of the portfolio, and and we ended up modeling you know north of 200 different portfolios based on you know real bids and real uh, um, proposals from different developers, different ways in which you could combine what ended up being about 10 different assets uh, to to shape and produce. Um, a, a load shaped 90% carbon free energy supply to Google. Uh, in addition to that, we Google is also focused on pricing and also focused on the, the reduction in the market risk. And so we used our kind of trading and commercial capabilities to put in place market hedges and, and do a lot of the transactions that shaped all of that, you know, intermittent um, uh, and, and captured kind of the longs and shorts of the supply portfolio to provide the, the shaped product that Google really needed. So this was the kind of the essence of, of the deal and, and, and a lot of the work that went into this was understanding what's the portfolio that, um, that meets this high 90% uh, carbon-free target, um, but that also does so in a cost, uh, cost acceptable manner. 
and as as uh, as I'm sure you understand, uh, the storage is is going to end up being a critical part of that. And and Mike showed a version of this in his slides that talks through kind of the day to day. Um, I think he did a pretty good job walking through the kind of the individual hours and what was there. This is more of a stylized example uh, with the the CFE. Uh, output per hour to the customer with just solar, wind, and storage. Um, as you mentioned, the, the the portfolio that we ended up putting together for Google did include some hydro as well, which is great. Uh, has a different, anytime you can get a generation source with a different, uh, with a different generation profile, it really adds to the, to the CFE output here. So yeah, Mike already highlighted kind of the, the uh, I won't go into the detail. Mike already highlighted a lot about how the solar, uh, the storage in particular tends to work really uh, charging during the, the largely the daylight uh, over generation hours when we're long on renewable energy and dispatching it back into the system in those hours when the portfolio was short. Uh, this chart right here shows an average day. So it really smoothens out a lot of the, the daily volatility that you'll get, um, you know, that takes into account high wind days, low wind days, high solar days, low solar days hydrological differences for the hydro plants. Um, at the end of the day, what makes storage so valuable here is its surgical nature. Um, you know, I talked in one of the previous slides about how uh, putting more wind can get you some of those evening and nighttime hours, but um, I think I called it the Jackson Pollock approach, right? You're really throwing a lot of megawatt hours of paint at that canvas. Um, and a lot goes to waste because you're not hitting exactly where you need to, you're not hitting the pixels that you really need. And the beauty of energy storage in this picture is that it becomes extremely surgical. You're taking exactly the hours that you need, um, pulling them out when you don't need them and putting them in exactly when you need them. And, and, and that's why we think uh, the linchpin of, um, of, a, of a grid that is gonna be 100% carbon free is gonna be uh, storage. To give you another kind of uh, a, a conforming viewpoint on that, this is a, a slide and a graphic from a report that RMI came out with in the last couple of months called Clean Power by the Hour. Uh, they show a similar message here on how, crit how critical storage ends up being for really getting to that higher uh, level of CFE. Um, I'll, I'll note here that the x-axis that shows percentage match is a different metric than the 24-7 CFE um, calculation methodology that um, I have in the rest of the presentation that Mike had. So, you know, put that aside for the moment, but the trend really of what you're seeing here as, uh, as you layer on different generation technologies and storage technologies is correct. So what you'll see is as you're in the lower, um, lower match percentages or lower CFE percentages, you know, you, you, can, you can get a long way by throwing wind and solar into the mix. And those are the lowest cost options to increase your CFE if you're starting at a very low base. But there'll come a point when uh, the, the least cost approach to getting to those remaining hours and achieving higher percentage match hours or CFE percentage hours is going to be storage. And, and that's what this slide shows. Um, that as you as you ratchet up in this case beyond 45 or 50 50 percent storage really becomes critical because you're not you know, you're not throwing um, intermittent wind megawatt hours for instance or uh, less predictable wind megawatt hours um, or, or excessive solar megawatt hours at the at the mix you're you're being as I as I mentioned before quite surgical in your approach last slide uh, is really just talking about as we move forward you know what has caused companies to be able to advance their renewable objectives, you know, going from the sustainability uh, objectives of two decades ago to today is really the development of technology, the development of products and services that make newer and better and higher sustainability standards achievable. Um, and, and, and that's where we are today with 24-7. So there's a number of efforts underway, certainly within our company, but in many, many other companies as well, to push the tools for 24-7. Um, on the load side, it's really about hourly load data aggregation, people understanding what their uh, hourly uh, profile is, understanding where they have load flexibility and the carbon intensity of a particular grid, a grid in scenarios in which they can uh, ramp down their own load in especially carbon intensive hours. On the supply side, um, a lot of areas uh, that storage touches very heavily. Uh, I've already talked about the nature of multi-technology shaped clean energy. 
um, thinking about the dispatch algorithms that one needs to have uh, when they're maximizing not for the price of energy, but for the carbon-free content of, um, of the grid and the, the supply that is being delivered to a customer. Um, happily, there's a lot of correlation between those two. It's not perfect, but uh, but but it tends to serve in both directions if you're if you're dispatching the um, the storage facility appropriately. And then the last piece is on hourly renewable energy credits. Um, for those that are familiar, renewable energy credits today are you know effectively a monthly tool. There is not hourly granularity on when a particular re renewable megawatt hour was generated. Um, there are efforts underway to change that uh, and to tag those recs. Uh, that's a, a kind of a, a nascent area that's starting to um, that's starting to increase and get more attention. And and the real benefit to that, I think, from a storage perspective, is it starts to bring storage into the mix. Now, if you have a data tag that has an hour on it, um, a rec produced at noon is not the same value as a rec produced at uh, at 8 p.m., for instance, and so if a if a if a noon rec is worth five or six dollars, um, you know maybe maybe the rec for a company that's trying to be 24/7 uh, at 8 p.m. is worth 12 or 15, and so all of a sudden you're starting to create price signals and incentives uh, for more storage to be deployed into the system. So um, I think I'll leave it at that. Moving on to Q&A, but I think overall messaging for you all, I think uh, this. Sustainability goal of uh, of of hourly matching in 24/7 um, very material. I think it's here to stay. I think you'll see more and more companies adopt it. And you know the great news for the storage uh, sector is that the storage is just an in instrumental and critical part of of making that future possible. Thanks for your time. Uh, and thank you very much, uh, Niraj. And uh, again, I apologize for the. Uh, disruption earlier in the program. Uh, my audio apparently went out for quite some time. Um, and uh, uh, luckily, everything I had to say was said much better by the uh, three panelists. So I appreciate that. Uh, we have some questions. And of course, um, uh, you can continue to uh, submit questions in the chat box. And um, uh, during the, the end of the pro uh, through the, uh, the end of the program, uh, let's get to a few right now. Um, Here's an interesting one. This is for Mike. Um, uh, how do you deal with the battery losses involved with storage and discharging? How does this impact the overall carbon profile? Uh, that, that's a very good question. Um, one that we, I guess, have addressed somewhat indirectly. Um, we've not We've not actually, important to note, we've not actually operationalized the deal that we talked about with, with AES. So some of this will be to be determined between the, the, the teams on the operations front. But um, when we think about the losses, I would say that we would address them via the, the charging component, uh, you know, is going to require more than what we end up discharging given the inherent efficiency loss. And we would be calculating the amount of megawatt hours charged uh, from the sort of account of excess CFE, the ledger, if you will, and then only attributing the increase in CFE for the uh, for the product to the discharge amount metered. So I think you know we would address that sort of indirectly by um, capturing all the charged energy from the uh, total amount of excess CFE. Hope that answers the question. Yeah, no, thank you very much. That was uh, great. Um, here's one that uh, is interesting. This could be uh, any any of the three panelists. What has been the cost of carbon offsets for commercial entities? So this is sort of a competing product uh, in some respects, although obviously it doesn't have the 24-7 characteristics. But uh, just as a benchmark, what has been the cost of carbon offsets for for commercial entities recently? It's a good question. It's something I don't have personal knowledge of. I know as a as a general policy matter, uh, as I mentioned in the slide, kind of showing how we've thought about the structuring of our goal relative to 100% renewable and relative to, to carb, just period carbon free. You know, we, we wanted to move to a world where um, we're not leading to any carbon emissions period, as opposed to 
emitting and then buying offsets. So it's not something that certainly my team has been actively focused on and not something that I understand Google has been um, eyeing too strongly. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, I'm, uh, I'm getting quite a few questions here now. Um, let me sift through a little bit. Um, Kind of durations. This uh, could be for uh, for Mike or Niraj. Niraj, um, what kind of durations of energy storage do Google and AES think will be required to meet the 24/7 goals? Yeah, good question. So I, I think in 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 the, the the transaction that we did today, we're looking at four-hour durations, um, kind of the, a bit of the market standard uh, that we're seeing right now. Um, certainly, you can think about for certain applications going longer durations on this. Uh, it really depends on a little bit of the nature of the grid that you're in and, and where you end up being short and the portfolio that you put together. But as we looked at it right now, um, four seemed to be about the sweet spot for, uh, you know, relative to the load we were trying to serve and the, the generation profiles of the assets that we had in the mix. All right, thank you. Um, Here's a question. Oh, geez, I just lost it here. Yeah, how uh, this uh, uh, Priya or uh, maybe uh, uh, Mike or or Niraj, um, how do you think about 24/7 carbon-free energy in markets without direct retail supply? For example, SPP or regulated territories. Mike, Mike, do you want to start, and, and then I can, I can always add to that. But I, you know, sure. I think you guys, you guys have been doing a lot of thought around that. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I can take a first crack. Um, so the, the example that we shared of AES uh, and the retail supply deal for Northern Virginia is just an example of how we could achieve our goal. Um, we have, as I mentioned early on, quite a few data centers in different regions, some of which have that capability to structure such a deal, and some of which don't. We're equally comfortable, although it's you know a bit more work on our side, um, assembling the CFE portfolio ourselves. And this SPP, whoever asked the question, you know, rightly called out, and, and uh, building up sort of a book of resources and, and PPAs. That's that's precisely what we've done in, in SPP to date. Um, what we like about the retail supply structure um, when it's available is number one, you know, it sort of bundles all that. And as Niraj mentioned, there's kind of risk management piece that, you know, is offloaded from us to the supplier. Um, and then secondarily, you know, we're able to um, sort of outsource some of that local development knowledge for finding the right resources, right? Our, our team is relatively lean internally. And as we, as I flagged in the slide, we have a lot of different regions to, to keep tabs on. And it's, unless we wanted to, scale our headcount really aggressively, it would be hard for us to be experts in all those regions. So we like the, the kind of bundled, um, we'll call it like an energy manager type approach that was offered by AES in, in Northern Virginia. Hope that answers the question, Priya. If you want to add anything else, feel free. You know, I think I think, I think think you covered, I, you know, again, I think you covered that really well um, with with a specific example. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think that, you know, other companies are thinking about it in a in a similar way. Um, you know, in in order to kind of get to twenty four seven, um, carbon free energy. And and again, I think depending on which region you're in and what's kind of available, the ability to kind of access the the type of of clean energy. Um, uh, but you know, both kind of um, uh, you know, renewable energy contracts and and kind of what's feasible. Like you know, that I think the the portfolio of, of what gets put together might be slightly different, and there'll be different limitations based on which whatever market you're operating in. Um, which you know, um, so so I think um, so yeah. So so that's all that I'll add to that. Maybe Mark, one last comment before we move on to the next question. Um, a, a category of region that we I didn't touch on in my response would be a region where there really isn't a corporate PPA uh, world to speak of, and you know retail supply is not an option. It's just sort of more vertically integrated utility market, which we have data centers in. And in those cases, you know we're certainly working with our utility partners to advance kind of early stage conversations about 
what a 24 seven based tariff could look like. Or for the example, um, in TVA, which is all public, you know, they have a corporate renewables procurement program, which is quite robust. And uh, working with them to solicit for new resources that can help us build up our carbon free energy profile across the region. That's it for me. Appreciate that. Thanks for the uh, thanks for the addition on that. Um, we've got a couple of time for a couple more questions. Uh, this came in a little earlier in the program, but I think it could apply to any or all of the panelists. Um, more details on the contribution of storage in 24-7 CFE would be helpful. For example, where are the batteries located? On the grid and under contract to the consumer or behind the meter of the consuming facility? So I, think, so I, I can start with that. So, so in our case, um, they're grid connected. Um, as Mike mentioned, I think uh, in his remarks, um, they really can be. They're open to how whether the whether the storage facility is actually tied to a particular generation generation asset or just generally connected within the same grid where the where the electrons and megawatt hours are moving in and out. Um, tying to the facility is another question, meaning the data center facility in this case. Um, Mike can certainly speak more to that, but I, I suspect that the um, the answer could be any of the above, but they will have slightly different you know use cases and economic profiles depending on where they're connected in. Yeah, I think Niraj had all the high points. You know, um, we we've certainly received proposals for and explored um, both batteries co-located with carbon free energy generation resources. Uh, energy storage resources proposed behind the meter at our data center facilities. You know, the topic that often comes up is how can we uh, potentially capture some value from replacing our diesel generators, which is something we're actively um, involved with. But primarily, our carbon free energy goal is a you know front of the meter supply based goal. Um, we haven't been really anchoring our our approach in behind the meter solutions on the generation or the storage front. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just just add to that that again, in terms of kind of the trends that that we've been seeing kind of in the market across uh, across the deals, most of the projects have been front of the meter. Okay, appreciate that. You know, I think we've arrived at the end of the hour, uh, and I'd like to thank the presenters for a very informative session. Uh, there are a lot of questions that were submitted that we did not have the opportunity to address. Um, but uh, if you'd like to repeat those questions uh, during the discussion with Jonathan Bird of Duke Energy uh, in a few minutes, that would be a, a terrific time to uh, continue the conversation. Uh, you can use the Zoom link that was included in your registration confirmation or that's in the chat box uh, here. So uh, we're going to uh, uh, say goodbye for the webinar. Please join us uh, at the uh, Zoom meeting. And stay safe and healthy and have a great rest of the day. Thank you all.